Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome. This session will deal with human computer interaction. Basically, overall interaction with all kinds of machines, but since today computer is used almost everywhere, whatever system you consider, it is automated to some extent, and automation is at the level of computer computerization. Therefore, human computer interaction becomes the area of interest. Just to recapitulate what we have done in the earlier sessions, we talked about workload and stress and how it has different influences in terms of physiological arousal and performance. Then we talked about the yers dodson law, which provides an optimal level of stress at which the performance is maximum. Then how automation can handle these issues to some extent and uh, to apply in situations where human intervention should be minimized. The levels of automation approach defines assignment of system control between a human and a machine. In and dependence on automation depend on automation reliability. And we saw how the two are related with each other. We talked about adaptive automation and just this slide again recapitulates what we had done. And basically, adaptive automation is something like a dynamic function allocation. So it should not be considered as once for all times to come that allocation is there. And we talked about various decisions on how, what part of the task will be controlled or done by automation and what by the human and that depends on the workload. A task manager takes a decision about the allocation. Then we talked about levels of automation and tasks and what is to be automated. And that leads to the design considerations based on human aspects. So human-centered automation is what can lead to more efficient performance and effective performance. And uh, the question is, what aspects of task or task complex should be automated? Either a part of the task can be automated, or the entire task can be automated. And accordingly, it's called adaptive AD and adaptive task allocation. Now, three issues uh, are of major concern to adaptive automation. One is what to adapt. Other is how to infer when to adapt. And third is who decides whether to implement or remove adaptation. So we can look at some situations like B and C and A in a situation where B represents automation. So B is a point in this space comprising workload and situation awareness on the two independent dimensions. And when we look at automation, completely automated situation, the situation awareness is low and also the workload is low. Whereas the three other points indicate C, for example, represents high situation awareness, D represents high workload, and A represents a combination of the two where some kind of manual performance of the task is required. So if we shift C to B, then the workload does not change. It doesn't do anything to the workload. It only changes the situation awareness. Similarly, in moving from D to B, only workload changes. It does nothing to the situation awareness. So from A, if we do complete automation, then both can be affected. So workload can be reduced. Situation awareness can be reduced. And then one has to decide whether situation awareness is important in, under certain conditions. So the appropriate choice should be the one 
that reduces workload to the greatest extent. To what extent can the workload be reduced? Situation awareness can be taken care of. Now, how to infer when to adapt? There are certain assumptions. For example, one of the assumptions is the operator and the automated system have knowledge of each other's current capabilities, performance, and state. That is how the task will be divided between the two. There are different approaches, environmentally determined. So for example, here we can control the environment. That slide is not here. But since environment determines stress and other things, so we can control the environment uh, to do that. Then continuous assessment of operator performance. Basically, operator performance will again depend upon the mental state, the kind of information that is being processed at a particular time. And that all will lead to physiological changes, arousal, etc. For example, therefore, primarily, continuous assessment is done to physiological measures for pupil dilation, body temperature, and similar other measures. And continuous assessment of mental workload is also important. Now, who decides whether to implement or remove automation? The task manager. Who is the task manager? Therefore, that is important. Should the system decide or the human operator decide? Continued and better understanding the fundamentals of human attention, human performance theory, communication cooperation, and trust play a key critical role in this domain. So we have done all these concepts earlier, for example, attention, information processing, and, information, and performance on various systems. And all that information can now be integrated in terms of the decision about implementation or removal of automation. So learning outcome from the earlier session are that uh, we are able to look at automation in a certain way. Now, in today's session, the topics that will be covered will help you in answering certain questions or describing certain situations. So after this session, you will be able to describe the four major disciplines to which human-computer interaction contributes. We'll look at these disciplines, discuss the importance of usability and ease of use of computer systems for efficient HCI. So usability and usefulness are two very major components of whether a system will be accepted or not, whether a computer or an automation will be accepted or not. And this includes everything about the computer, the internet, the web, the system itself sitting on a desktop, for example, and so on. Discuss the role of mental model in designing HCI. Mental models play a very important role. These models are some abstract representations in the mind. And if a proper mental model is shared between the system designer and the user, then system will perform effectively. Describe the role of human capabilities in the design of human computer interfaces. So capabilities in terms of sensory capabilities, memory capabilities, motor performance capabilities, all those capabilities that we talked about in earlier sessions. So revising those concepts becomes important. So what is HCI and why do we need it? HCI is the study of interaction between the human operator and computers, simple. The term is that, human-computer interaction. Interfaces, displays and controls, for example, provide the first level of interaction between the two. And a lot of research was done earlier in designing the efficient and usable interaction devices. And today, a large number of designs for, let's say, keyboard are available. And we'll look at briefly about that. But these are the areas which can be studied and read in most of the literature. Then humans and computers interact to perform a task, which can be simple, for example, write a document, or complex, solve equations, or land a plane. So these are very complex tasks. And where a teamwork between the computer and the human being may be important, because a certain parts of the task may be more difficult, more complex, <clears throat> and may be efficiently done with the machine. 
HCI is important for the following reasons. One is computer systems are all pervasive. Today, we find almost you touch anything. <coughs> so, for example, uh, there may be a wristwatch, which includes computer, the cell phone. <coughs> so, even in our possessions at a given point of time, there is a large number of devices that use computers. And anywhere you look at them, they are available. Computers provide safety, satisfaction, and utility. They are safe to use in environments where it may be difficult for human beings or may, may be uh, not safe for human beings to perform. And then ease of use determines the product success. So we'll see this particular concept, ease of use, usability, and these become very relevant to the discussion of whether a computer system will be accepted or not by people or whether a technology will be accepted or not. Because if we develop a technology or if the designers develop a technology which will not be accepted or used by the users, people in general, then that technology has no meaning because after all, we design technologies for human beings. So what does HCI do? HCI facilitates users to carry out tasks safely, effectively, efficiently, and enjoyability. So in most situations, we consider safety, effectivity, and efficiency as very critical. But enjoyability is also important. In fact, many systems become very prevalently used, or they become very successful, because people enjoy using them. And the cell phone is one example. And before the computers came in, the automobile was the most successful machine that human beings used. So one of the reasons is that there's a feeling of control. For example, when we drive and we are sitting behind the wheel, a steering wheel, and then we move on a road, so we are controlling a system. And similarly, when we look at the cell phone, the use of the cell phone, the speed with which we can surf the internet and go from one place to another, talk to people, for example, communicate ideas, send messages. This is very fast. And feedback, therefore, uh, becomes very efficient. So all this counts, and this makes the human-computer interaction a very attractive area of research, and uh, which has grown over a period of time. So it's a multidisciplinary field, because human beings are there, computers are there, and cognitive science is involved. Cognitive science is an area which is largely dealt by, by philosophers, cognitive psychologists, computer scientists, economists. And uh, so a large number of inputs come to the cognitive science itself, basically dealing with information and knowledge, how the knowledge is acquired, organized, and operational definition of knowledge in terms of information, for example. And we have seen how information can be quantified in terms of bits, the smallest interval of information or, or unit of information. Then computer science contributes because the design of the computer itself is important. So knowing the computer, what is the design of the computer, what all is there in the computer, knowing the human beings, their capabilities, their mental powers, for example, and then human factors engineering, which is concerned with the design of the systems compatible with human capabilities, needs, interests, requirements, and so on. So these three major areas contribute to human-computer interaction, and they should all be considered important. They should all be investigated if we really want to develop an efficient human-computer interaction. HCI covers research in four major disciplines. One is human factors or ergonomics, and where we talk about human-machine systems. So machine is a very general term, and computers become very specific kind of machines where cognition, processes that are hidden, they are important. Then human performance itself. And we have seen in the earlier sessions how human performance is related to the situation, the capability of the individual, the nature of the task, motivation, complexity of the situation. Earlier sessions uh, were devoted to human performance, a couple of sessions. Then information systems also labeled data processing and management information systems. So it's largely an area where application in terms of the managerial decisions, for example, become important where there's a large amount of data 
is normally available to the managers and they have to take decisions on say uh, human resources, marketing and various other areas. Then computer science which has a narrow focus, computer human interaction. So uh, HCI or CHI they refer to the same thing. So some people want to write it as human computer or some people want to write the computer human interaction. Then it's associated mainly with computer science. So largely, you know, how, for example, memory how, how the memory is to be upgraded, how much information can be handled, speed of information processing, and coding, for example. So these areas or these points become relevant there. Then finally, library and information systems. This is actually the whole ideas about information. They came from information sciences. And this is an old field. In fact, now with the emergence of computers, it is in a new digital incarnation that includes important HCI research. So these four areas are the research related areas which must be pursued so that HCI can be understood more effectively and scientifically and new developments can take place. So this question one can ask, why are mobile phones so successful? Why do people accept a technology? And as I mentioned a few slides earlier, a few minutes earlier, the idea is that the, the feeling of control, the sense of controlling a system, that is the central point to be considered. And any system which will allow a good feel of the control of the system, that I am in control, I can do something here by using this, something more, extra, faster, without errors or with fewer errors. These considerations lead to the success of a technology. So do, they, do people accept a technology just because they are in control? Or is there a more general idea behind it? Why should people accept a technology? And what intervenes between technology acceptance and technology availability? So a technology may be available, but all technologies are not very successful. Is it because of the complexity? People can't use it. They don't understand what is happening. What is the usability of that for their area of work or field, etc.? So why should they spend so much of money or time, money in purchasing and time in learning, for example? because learning has to be done. Will learning be very efficient as far as a new technology is concerned, when new systems come in, or will, will it require more effort? So even that can influence the acceptability of a technology. Ease of use determines user experience. So cell phone is so easy to use. Today, even the children can use it. I know that in schools today, they teach Python in class five, for example. So, uh, about 15 or 20 years back, using Python wasn't there, but many other software, you know, uh, individuals had to learn. But now, even children can learn very fast. So the, there's a usefulness, there's an ease of useful or use of the software, and this gives a nice experience to the children. So learning is very quick. Ease of use and usability are the key concepts related to technology acceptance. So basically, if we know how easy it is to use a technology and how, what is its usability, then the technology will be accepted. But is it accepted directly or there is some other thing which intervenes? And what will be the success rate of technology acceptance between usability and use and final acceptance? So there's a model called the technology acceptance model. People accept technology depending on what the technology provides. And this is a very useful model in business, for example, business areas. But this can be used anywhere. And for computers also, it can be used. So there are some external variables. For example, what kind of task do I want to do? Is it complex? Will it require decision making? What level of information processing is required in doing this task? On the basis of which, there is a perceived ease of use 
of a technology that is available and perceived usefulness. For example, this may appear like a very uh, far, far example, but suppose, you know, I have to buy a shirt. And then, do I have an emotional system within me, which will tell me, oh, this is the color that you should buy, because you like it and people around you will like this particular color. And if that technology is available, that is useful to me. Uh, I see, I perceive a usefulness in that. And it's easy, I just go scan the particular shirt and uh, lo, the response is there. Now, ease of use also determines perceived usefulness. So initially, usefulness may not be there. You know, when uh, people start buying smartphones, for example, initially they may not be even able to know or use at all all the functions that are available in the cell phone. And that happens with the computers. All the functions people may not, every user may not use, only a limited functions of that particular technology may be useful to the individual. But whatever it is, given a task situation, given a context, within that, if the system is, has perceived usefulness, then uh, that system will be used. So perceived usefulness is determined by external variables as well as ease of use, perceived ease of use. These two determine perceived usefulness. And then perceived ease of use and perceived usefulness, they determine the attitude toward using that particular technology. Attitude is a kind of state of evaluation, feeling that the individual gets about the particular technology. So an individual may be positively inclined, for example, if the individual has a positive attitude or maybe negatively inclined. So uh, I, I may be positively inclined about using a particular system and so I have a positive attitude. So attitude is a measure of belief. What is my belief about the system? So if I have the belief that this system will do the task as I want to do the task, this system will be efficient, this system will be effective, then these are my beliefs. So attitude statements are some cognitive beliefs and they are also emotional feelings. That is, I evaluate this particular technology positively or negatively. So evaluation, belief, they all constitute attitudes. And in that sense, attitudes are multidimensional concepts. And attitudes may include uh, various uh, elements, for example. So there may be an attitude toward particular component of the technology. Toward some components, I may be positively inclined. Toward other, I may not be positively inclined. So for example, you have to buy a computer. Price is one attribute of the computer. And if it is very high, then I may be negatively inclined toward price. But as far as the system is concerned, I may be positively inclined about other aspects. So it may be a small system. Uh, it will require a less space, a sector, et cetera. The overall attitude about the object will therefore depend upon these individual attitudes. This is one kind of model where we can find weighted evaluations, weighted beliefs. And then we can add all these weighted beliefs, add them to get the total attitude toward the object. So there are mathematical models and there are other kinds of ways in which overall attitude can be derived from the component attitudes. Now this attitude, the belief that this system has these attributes or this system will help me in executing behaviors which will be socially uh, evaluated, for example, positively. This can be an attitude. Now this attitude leads to behavioral intention to use. Intention is not the actual behavior. It is the likelihood that the system is useful to me, I will use the system and it is easy to use. So the likelihood that I will use the system is what is intention. So generally if a question is asked, how likely is it that you will buy this system in next two years, next five years? 
uh, likelihood of using a system is the behavioral intention. Most important aspect is that this behavioral intention is translated into the actual behavior, which is actual system use. So I may have the intention to use a system, but I may not use it. So now this, therefore, the entire model indicates different levels of stages and they are probabilistically related. So what is the probability that if these external variables is there, I will perceive the system as useful, I will perceive the system to be easy to use. What is the like probability that these will converge into some attitude? What is the probability that that will go to behavioral intention? And finally, what is the probability to go to actual system use? So one can see that initially we may be having a very high intention. but the, because of various reasons, the translation of that intention into behavior may be low, so that probability. So the total probability then, because these are considered dependent stages, therefore the total probability will be the product of these probabilities. The overall probability will therefore be much less for, as compared to the probability of translation at individual stage level. So what is usability? It is the extent to which a product can be used by specified users. So technology may not be useful to all. To achieve specified goals, therefore they will use the system for those particular goals in those particular contexts. With effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction in a specified context of use. So this is a very standard definition of usability and this applies to all systems. Thus, usability of a system is a multidimensional concept, multidimensional in terms of the effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction. So these are the three, basically these are the three components of usability. If a system will lead to effective task performance and efficient task performance and provide satisfaction, then it is it has usability to me. So thus, usability of a system is a multidimensional concept. Quantification metrics are available for the component dimension. So all these dimensions can be measured, based on which the overall usability of the system can be measured. We can take weighted combinations, or we can find out how the different elements are weight, weighted. For example, uh, whatever metrics are available, we can ask the respondents to weight the, these three dimensions. So which is the most important, effectiveness or efficiency and satisfaction and respondents may assign certain numbers and these become the weights. So let us see how uh, these elements can be defined and measured. Effectiveness, uh, so these definitions also provide the operational statements about how the measurement should be carried out, what are the different ways in which these elements or attributes can be measured. Effectiveness is the accuracy, which is in terms of the satisfactory task completion or low error rate, with which the design supports the user to complete the intended action. And this definition directly leads to the measurement of effectiveness. Efficiency is the speed with which users can perform tasks through the easiest process. <clears throat> so efficiency does not only mean that the task will be completed, but given three or four different technologies, if one technology is easiest, then obviously that is more efficient <clears throat> as far as this definition is concerned. Then engagement. The design provides pleasure in use and is appropriate to the user's industry and topic. So, Engagement is important, that is the task is engaging. In engagement, the individual gets lost and the environmental conditions may no more be important and there the focus remains on the particular task and the use of the system, for example. Ease of learning. New users can accomplish goals easily and even more easily on future visits. So that means 
learning is fast. And on the first trial itself, the user should be able to use it easily. But then as learning happens, it will get automated. You know, we have discussed about how the automation comes in because a lot of training or experience or learning <clears throat> and therefore the task operation or use of technology become, it gets automated. Then tolerance for error. How much error can I accept? If there's a technology and if I do something, <clears throat> how much error is possible? And if I can compare different technologies, which technology will lead to more error, more or less error? How much error can I tolerate? Because there'll be various other things, the price, the volume of space, uh, that the technology will cover and whether it is um, portable, mobile, uh, you know, these considerations will also be there in a, addition to uh, particular efficiency considerations. So whenever we are asking or answering these questions, we have to keep in mind the other attributes that might be present. So tolerance for error supports a range of user actions and only shows an error in genuine erroneous situations. So there is an error. Two broad indicators of tolerance for error are the number, type, and severity of common errors users make, and how easily users can recover from those errors. So what are the errors, and how is it possible to recover from those errors? So tolerance for error determines the extent to which the individual is willing to adopt or adapt an innovative technology. And this is also called category width. So if the category width is large, that means tolerance for error is large, and therefore the individual will be willing to adapt new technologies. So this is how new technologies get adapted and become useful, and they find a market and usability and all that. So tolerance for error, if it is high, the, the individual is called a broad categorizer. If the tolerance for error is low, then the individual is called a narrow categorizer. So a broad categorizer is willing to try new brands, whereas a narrow categorizer chooses established or familiar alternatives. So you know, this should provide important inklings to the designer, system designer. Should they throw a, an innovative or a new product in the market, will it get successful? So although it may be difficult to immediately do a survey and find out its acceptability uh, or tolerance because of tolerance for error, but a, a small pilot study will generally reveal this. <coughs> so what are the usability metrics for effectiveness? First one is task completion rate. This is simple to measure. Effectiveness is a binary measure of completion rate, either one or zero. So if a task is completed successfully, acceptably, assign it a value 1. If not, then 0. So effectiveness is defined as small n upon capital N into 100%, where n is the number of tasks completed, small n, and capital N is the total number of tasks undertaken, simple. So suppose an individual is doing 20 tasks on a computer, and then uh, 14 out of that are completed successfully then uh, the, the efficiency is 70% based on accuracy, or effectiveness is 70%. The number of errors uh, also become important. Effectiveness is assessed as the total number of errors or unintended actions, slip, so errors we have already talked about, these are the possible errors, unintended actions, slips, mistakes, or omissions that the user makes while attempting a task. Then usability, how do we measure usability? One is, uh, in terms of efficiency, one is time-based efficiency. And this is a simple formula of time-based efficiency, where n is the total number of tasks or goals, r is the number of users. So overall efficiency depends upon the number of users for a particular task. Or then nij, small nij, is the result of task i by user j. If the user successfully completes the task, then nij equal to 1. If not, nij equal to 0. So tij is the time spent by user j 
to complete task i. So, there are several tasks, you add all those. If the task is not successfully completed, then time is measured till the moment the user quits the task. So, if the user says, okay, I am not able to do it, I am quitting, then that is the time from the start time. So, this is time based efficiency. Similarly, there is overall efficiency. And here, overall efficiency is defined as uh, this uh, ratio of n i j t i j sum over all uh, divided by t i j. This gives overall efficiency. The symbols have the same meaning as in the time based efficiency. So, we can quantify effectiveness, we can quantify efficiency and that will give us usability of the system. So, usability can be quantified. <clears throat> then usability matrix for satisfaction. Satisfaction is a subjectively measured dimension or sub dimension of usability and uh, there are different subjective questionnaires which include various items and they are based for the task level and uh, also the test level. So, the task level satisfaction is measured with uh, several questionnaires after scenario questionnaires. So, when the scenario is over, then three questions are administered. NASA's task load index, uh, we have already talked about it while talking ab about stress. Then SMEQ, subjective mental effort questionnaire, how much mental effort is required. You, uh, and then usability magnitude estimation, there is only one question and single ease question, that is one question. So, what, how do you want to administer these subjective measures? Whether you want a very converging measurement, then you use a questionnaire which has more questions. Reliability is generally also higher for questionnaires which have more than one item. Then level of satisfaction, again there is system usability scale, uh, then standardized user experience percentile rank questionnaire, then computer system usability questionnaire, then questionnaire for user interaction satisfaction, and then finally software usability measurement inventory. So, these questionnaires provide subjective measures of satisfaction. And so, after measuring effectiveness etc., effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction, as I said, we can take a weighted average. And these weights can also be derived on the basis of responses from the user. Now, how to maximize <coughs> ease of use? Uh, consider the user's goals, because it, it is a user centered development of technology, and some user is going to use it. Therefore, user should be at the center, at the core. What are the overall goals of the user? What do the users want to achieve ultimately? For example, a healthier blood pressure level. So, that is, so there may be various ways to have a healthier blood pressure level. This is the overall goal for an individual. They, you can take other examples. Then completion goals, what they expect to have happened after using the product. So, if I use a particular computer for a long time, will my blood pressure rise? That may be an important question. So, the completion goal will be lower blood pressure. Overall health based on blood pressure and now it is becoming more specific. So, from very general goal, we are moving to specific goal. And then finally, behavioral goals. What they would do to achieve the goal without the product? So, manually record their daily salt intake if they did not have your application for example. So, this is uh, what can be done. So, first of all consider the user at the center. Then how to maximize ease of use? Know the user characteristics, physical and cognitive abilities of the user. For example, if it will require a lot of energy expenditure then will this provide an ease of use to the user. So, they understand their physical and cognitive abilities. What are the limitations in their physical and cognitive processes or various stages? 
then special needs, there may be special needs, for example, age, because of age, because of the, uh, you know, sickness, uh, because children, for example, so diversity, consider diversity. Personality and culture, there may be culturally dependent situations where certain systems may be acceptable or not acceptable and personality of the category width, for example, toler or tolerance for error is one measure of personality. There is a large number of personality assessment techniques. Knowledge and skills. So, if a particular technology requires some level of knowledge and some level of skills, then those individuals who do not have the preparation for that or do not have proper training to use the system, then this system is uh, not useful. Motivation to use. If individuals are not motivated, so, marketing efforts sometimes are devoted to motivate individuals. Marketing efforts need not be economy based, for example. They may be education based. So, in the classroom, you know, uh, some instructors would say that use this system because this system provides these, these, these facilities or use, use to whatever we are doing in the class. Then individual differences. All users are not alike. So, there are individual differences. People will differ on all these aspects that we have discussed above. And also users are not like the designer. So, if I am designing something and if I have some understanding about myself, about my skills, uh, my cognitive abilities, my personality, my culture and I design a system which will be useful to me, it does not necessarily mean that other individuals are like me. So, there are individual differences, there is diversity and there are other issues to be considered, situations in which the uh, system will be used. Then mental models become very relevant here. Mental models are abstract inner representations that people have regarding things from the external world. So, I have a mental model of everything and sitting here for example, I have a mental model of the layout uh, say streets, roads, etc., houses, buildings, landmarks. You know, I have some mental model. I have a mental model about my house. So, if somebody asks me how many windows are there in my house, then I walk through that mental model. I have a pictorial representation. Mental models can be for language, they can be for processes, they can be for, for functions and so on. So, mental models are how I represent the external reality in my mind. And whenever needed, I can use it to describe things, to explain things. So, mental models include your basic ideas of what something is, how it is supposed to work, processes, working process. Designers frequently research to identify users' mental models and apply these findings into the design framework. All this should go into the design. The design stage is very critical because it is there that the design can be more flexibly changed with less cost, it will be less costly and so on. So, uh, designers frequently research to identify users' mental models and apply these findings into the design framework in order to build on top of the users' existing expectations and beliefs. Because if there is a system that I develop that meets only those requirements, present beliefs and expectations are not met, the system is no good. I will go for a new system, new technology, accept a technology only if it, it can do something extra, more with least effort. Then interaction designers focus on learnability and ease of use. How fast can I learn a new system or any system? Any system that I have never used in the past is new to me. So, it need not be a new system as far as the market is concerned, as far as the environment is concerned. It can be a new system for me. The notion of mental models has applicability and explanatory power on this aspect. So, it can be applied and this explains how things will become relevant or acceptable. So, this is a good uh, representation of mental model given by Norman where, you know, designer has a mental model. And how does the, if the designer's mental model is consistent with the user's mental model, 
then the objective is achieved that is the technology will be accepted or will be used but how does the designer know the mental model of the user the designer knows about the mental model of the user only from the system image so the assumption is that if there is a system which is developed its image is there in the mind of the designer as a mental model and if there are users that is why whenever a new technology is to develop the technology should be run on a certain small sample and then one can test for what if the mental model of the designer is appropriate to the mental model of the user so this is how the mental model will help or helps in designing new technologies the problem of ensuring that the user's mental model corresponds to the designer's model arises because the designer designer doesn't know or doesn't talk directly with the user the designer can only talk to the user through the system image the designer's materialized mental model so system image is the designer's mental model. so if i draw a map for example and if i draw a map a road is going like that and the road, i am putting the i am putting my mental model into a materialized into a physical representation and here when the system is designed then that designer's mental model is getting translated into a physical system the system image is like a text open to interpretation and therefore uh, you know it is advisable to determine system so that uh, some definite mental models can be created so just to summarize what we have done in automation in today's session automation is an approach to reduce human intervention in processes the levels of automation approach defines the assignment of system control between a human and computer different stages of automation are related to the information processing stages both automation over trust or and over dependence and under trust and under dependence have their consequences we have seen what consequences they have so um, that can lead to complacency for example and uh, first error and then how uh, that cycle goes on both the system and the user can initiate changes in the levels of automation in adaptive automation so we talked about adaptive automation that is the user center or the human center Uh, development or technology hci covers research in four major areas and we have looked at those four major areas in terms of information science in terms of uh, human factors in terms of uh, the, the the data processing and so on technology acceptance model relates usefulness and ease of use to the acceptance of a technology by a user then usability is a multi dimensional construct which can be measured we can measure it mental models provide a useful basis for the design of computers or technology in general so understanding mental models is very critical and one should go into great details before a system can be designed the idea is that the designer's mental model should be translated into the physical system and then that physical system should be tested with the mental model of the user this is how you know one can achieve the balance and the entire design process can be helpful now there are some questions for discussion and uh, these questions will help to understand the concepts uh, better more easily self administer the levels of automation scale earlier in the earlier session we talked about the levels of automation scale and those 10 items are available and that scale measures the extent to which the entire thing is assigned to the computer entire task is assigned to the computer or to the human and those 10 levels can be measured and if you want you can also make changes you can have a 7 level scale or a 20 level scale it all depends so 10 levels are not very secure science but the idea is that that provides enough indication about uh, you know what is 
the level of allocation. So self administer the level of automation scale for a system that you are currently using or have used in the past. So what is your experience and how do you rate that system on the level of automation? Explain the results in terms of the concepts learned in this session. So the basic idea behind these questions is not only to you know, do something which has been done in the session, but to extend, to go beyond it. And that is why in most of the sessions, I have been talking about uh, review of literature, asking questions which are not covered in the presentation, because that way one can apply whatever knowledge is gained in a particular session. Second question is, as the user of a computing software for data analysis, uh, you might have used various software, Python, SPSS, the R software, for example, or any other EYs or whatever, eViews. Describe the levels of automation for those systems. Your level of trust in and dependence on the software, how much trust did you have? How much? Because people, some users may say, oh, we don't understand what is happening in the black box behind the scenes. So we are just getting some results. How do we check the results? So they would like an interactive system. They would like a software so it is interactive. And therefore, whatever results are obtained are based on those actions taken by the user or by the researcher. So your level of trust in and dependence on the software and consequences of overtrust and overdependence, what will happen if you had an overtrust? You know? Will you feel comfortable with that system or uh, will you feel satisfied with that system? All that can be indicated. You may not be, you, you want, if you want, you can use some measurement as we have discussed. Indicate the experience in quantitative terms, some value. Compare your experience with two, uh, take any two software, right? And for each one of them, you repeat this and then compare. Uh, that way you can evaluate which system is more useful or usable. Review the literature to understand Moore's law. We have not talked about Moore's law. Moore's law suggests that technology advances at a very fast rate. And when the Moore's law was stated, it suggested that technology gets to double its speed of processing, for example, every year. Now probably it's happening very fast, faster, even faster than that. So Moore's law is a law which states how the technology advances, the speed with which it advances, and the speed with which the old technology becomes obsolete. Today, for example, cell phone becomes obsolete very fast, very soon. In fact, some experts suggest that you buy a cell phone now, you go out of the store, and if you want to come back, immediately you'll find that some new system has come in, new technology has come in. So the half-life of technology is reducing. So Moore's law is related to, let's say, half-life of the technology. So speed of processing, for example, has become very high over the years. Can the law be verified? Is it possible to verify this law? So review this law and then answer this question whether, what will you suggest? Will you suggest doing an experiment, doing a survey, uh, assessing various technologies at different points of time, and present data in support of the Moore's law? Question four, how does the concept of mental model apply to the following systems? Cloud computing, quantum computing, distributed computing, and the internet of things. So to these four systems, you use this concept of mental models. How does it help? So suppose you were a designer, and you were to design one of the new technologies. What would you do? If you have a mental model, how do you translate it into a physical incarnation or physical representation? Number five, review the literature on motion sickness. Compare motion sickness with VR sickness. So there will be virtual reality sickness, for example. So you review motion sickness. Motion sickness happens when we move very fast and uh, when our, our gaze changes at a very fast pace. So the image on the retina the old image remains, 
and new image gets overlapped. So, this overlapping of new information even before the old image is wiped out. So, if there is a very fast movement on in hill, hill areas for example, uh, on, on curved roads or paths this can happen and that is why people may have feeling of nausea, vomiting and all that. So, there is motion sickness. Motion sickness means the speed with which the information is getting registered by the retina is much faster than the speed with which the old information will be wiped out. And uh, also uh, review literature on virtual reality sickness. So, uh, look at the literature on virtual reality, for example, by using headsets and then that will also create sickness because the eye movement and head movement etcetera, the information falls at a faster rate, then we can remove the information from the receptors or we can process the information. So, sickness, motion sickness or virtual reality sickness is a result of the gap between the speed with which the information is being acquired or registered and being removed from the processor. Then is it practical and feasible to design infinitely fast machines? So, if the Moore's law suggests that speed is uh, increasing, will one day we will reach a stage or state whether you know the machine will become infinitely fast. Just put in the information and the results out there. We know for many complex computations for example, the system takes quite some time and it produces result after some time after a lot of information has been processed inside the machine. It depends on the complexity of the task and it depends upon how the information is distributed in the environment for example. Then seventh question, review the literature for various input, display and output devices. We have not talked about these devices, but these devices are the places uh, which provide the real interaction uh, or this can be called tangible interaction. So, all tangible interaction with the computer is through input devices, displays and output devices. Everything else, the mental model, the information processing and uh, solving a complex algorithm for example, all this happens inside the machine, is intangible. So, review the literature for various input display and output devices, develop a description of situated displays. Situated, situated displays are the displays that are used in specific uh, socio technical situations in on the airports for example. And the controls are not available or they may be on the touch screen for example, uh, you know uh, uh, taking a boarding pass on the airport for example, the user, the traveler can do that but there is a minimal interaction in that sense. So, general idea is uh, these uh, situated displays are locationally contexted. They are contextual in the sense that uh, they are located in a place and they give information only about that. So, closed information within a closed space only the relevant information is provided. These are some references which you can go through and uh, which you, you, you can read in slightly more detail to understand uh, certain things uh, that we have not covered. So, this concludes the course uh, where it is important to remember that human performance, human skills, various information processing stages and how these stages become important in uh, using systems and performing work and workload sector, they provide great information about the use of technology and development of new technologies. Thank you very much for the entire course.